God is good, and we are grateful today to be in this house one more time. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, we want to welcome you to the Community Praise Church here in Alexandria, Virginia. We trust that if you are ever in the area, that you would stop by and see us. And for those who are here, to God be the glory, great things he has done. We are grateful to continue in our sermonic journey through the epistle to the Romans, grace that works. Amen. We want to spend just a few moments to review what God shared with us on our last sermon. Of course, last week we had Dr. Patrick Vincent with us. But prior to that, we ended in Romans, the fourth chapter, with a firm foundation. Now, by the way, those of you who did not hear Elder Carlson's sermon on this morning, you need to get online and, and listen and hear about the two Adams. How, in fact, man, this, this thing was good. I was, how, 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 how God picked up where man failed. How God picked up the fumble, come on now, at the 25-yard line. And carry that thing in. Is there anybody this morning who's grateful that God picks up your fumbles? Whereas Adam's decision gave death, the decision of Jesus gives life. Whereas Adam's failure, I'm trying not to preach that thing again, it was good. Whereas Adam's failure brought condemnation, the death of Jesus brought liberation. And so in Jesus, we have a second Adam. But prior to that, we learned, we learned in a firm foundation of what it means to have a religion that is built on the rock. Everybody say the rock. And we've learned, next slide. Of course, we learned this from Romans, the fourth chapter, verses one through three. Listen to the word of God. Here is Paul speaking to his Jewish brothers and sisters. What then shall we say? That Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. Pause here. You all do remember that the, the, the argument against Paul's gospel was that the Jewish faith had not only thrived but survived based on traditions, customs, and standards. But Paul wants to take the very, the very epitome of what it means to be an Adventist, I mean to be a Jew. And share, hear me today, and share that the reason Abraham's faith was so significant was not because of his traditions, rules, or regulations. His religion was significant because he believed in the power of the cross. Here it is. Watch this next slide. The, the word of God reveals if, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to what? To boast about, but not before God. Paul says, when you look at Abraham's life, he had nothing to boast about. There was nothing in his life that merited God saying, that's my boy. You all do know that, that very seldom does God brag on us. Are you hearing me today? Oh, no, 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 no. He loves us. Huh? He cares for us, but God is not in the business of bragging on us because he knows us. Are you hearing me today? And when somebody knows you, come on, married people. Huh? When somebody knows the real you, you see, this is why I don't, you know, I don't really take this preaching thing. I take my calling seriously, but the preaching thing so seriously, because I have a wife who lives with me. I, and I told you a long time ago that I'm trying to live right because I don't want my wife out in the stage looking at me like this when I'm talking about the gospel. Y'all hear me today? So, so what I'm saying is that Paul is trying to convey the truth, church, trying to convey the truth that, that when you know Jesus... You have nothing to boast about. What does the scripture say? Here is the foundation of his hallelujah. Here's the foundation of his faith. Abraham did what? Am I reading the same thing here? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Come on. Help me. Abraham did what? There you go. He believed God and it was what? Credited to him as righteousness. In other words, the foundation of his faith was that he believed that God could make up for his deficiencies because of the cross, and through that faith transaction, God made up for what he did not have. Mm, mm. Next slide, watch this. We learn that if in fact, now I'm preaching this today, I'm reviewing this today, because I need you to, I need you to understand my burden. The pastor has a burden, particularly for Seventh-day Adventist Christians. I believe, I told you um, the last sermon that I'm, I was Adventist, Adventist born, Adventist bred, and when I'm gone, I'll be Adventist what? I believe in the church, but hear me today. I also believe today 
that if our church does not refocus on the central theme of the message, there is only one superstar in this church and his name is Jesus. And if we don't focus on that, then our religion will crumble in the midst of trial. That's the, the Bible says it, Matthew 7, 24. I want us to listen to this. Therefore, everyone who does what? These words of mine and does what? Puts them into? It's like a wise man who built his house on what? Yeah, that's built his house on Jesus. Here's what happens though when you when your house is not built on Jesus. Then the rain came down, pardon me, then the rains came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. That's talking about the trials and the tribulations in life. That's talking about the unforeseen circumstances that can rock your world. That's talking about when the doctor says that you have cancer. That's, that's when the husband or the wife is cutting up. The Bible says when your foundation is built on the rock, it did not fall because it had his foundation on the rock. Can you say amen to that today? We also learned a few truths. Let's go to the next, next slide. We learned that when you have this firm foundation, it provides a reason for what, everybody? for humility here's what the word of God says the Bible tells us in Romans and see where it is yes what does the scripture say Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness it goes on to say that Abraham had no reason to boast because Abraham understood that if there's anything that he had to boast about it was that God made up for his weaknesses that was his only boast but also believe next slide watch this the firm foundation, man, I have to pause, folks, you, I, this thing is just sweet to me. I like reading Romans more than I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When you, when, when you understand the power of a firm foundation, it means that you understand that God does not give us what we deserve. Can anybody say amen to that? Are you glad that God does not give you what you've earned? Listen, are you glad that God is not fair? Yes. <laughs> Are you hearing me today? Are you, are you glad that God is not equitable? That God is lopsided? Come on and say amen now. Here's what the Bible says. Watch this thing. However, to the one who does not work, whew, but trust God who justifies the who, everybody? That, that word translated in the original is justifies the wicked. Their faith is credited to them as righteousness. Can you say amen to that? God, hallelujah, let's just, listen, let's just bless Jesus today that he does not give us our paycheck, he gives us a bonus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, see, most of us, we don't work in, in big-time corporate America, some of, some of you do, but I've noticed, watch this, that some CEOs make more on the bonus than they make on that salary. Y'all hear me today? God, listen, listen, God does not give us our salary, he gives us our bonus. Can you say amen today? Here's the last thing we learned. A firm foundation means that it allows God to bless what is yet to be true. Woo! God, watch this. God can look at imperfection, call it perfection, and then bless it as if it was perfect. He, listen, God can look at issues, call you whole, and bless you as though you are complete. God can look at those things. Here's what it says, Romans 4. Man, this is good. Uh, Romans 4, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. God has the ability to bring life where there is now death. Can you say amen for Jesus today? Now, our passage of scripture this morning was read so ably. I want to refer us back now to Romans. If you would turn there. Romans, the sixth chapter. I'm just going to read a few verses in your hearing. Verses 3 and verse 4. To lift our time this morning in the word of God. Romans the 6th chapter. Verses 3 and verse 4. If you have it say amen. Or do you not know. That as many of us. As were baptized into Christ Jesus. Were baptized into his death. And here's the, here's the clincher. Therefore. We were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Can you say amen to the word of God this morning? 
I want to place a tag on this text and speak for just a few moments on the subject, blessed beneficiaries. Blessed beneficiaries. Spirit of the living God, Lord, I'm praying that you would help me today to articulate the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. My first prayer is that you would allow this power to be demonstrated in me. And then, Father, just help me to preach from the overflow of your goodness is my prayer today. Teach us, Father, not just the truths of justification, but teach us how we might have victory over sin. Teach us how to live for you is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessed beneficiaries. As our family began to grow, my, my wife and I decided that it was time for us to establish an estate plan. Make sure that we had all of our T's crossed and our I's dotted. After reviewing our assets, we quickly came to the conclusion that we had no estate. <laughs> Are y'all hearing me today? So we decided that it would be in the best interest of our children to secure a life insurance policy. And so we walked to our insurance agent and then he began to march us through the various policies that we, we could secure to make sure that our children were set up. He told us about universal life insurance and he taught us about variable life insurance and he taught us about level term life insurance. He taught us about decreasing term life insurance and then he mentioned whole life insurance. As a matter of fact, whole life insurance sounded pretty good. As a matter of fact, the kids will be set up better than they're living now with whole life insurance. Are you hearing me today? I could not help but to inject a moment of levity into the conversation for I stated to him, I said, well, I said, I'm not sure if I want the whole life insurance because uh, I, I want it to be a sad day when I'm gone. <laughs> I said, I don't want my kids showing up to the funeral with a smirk on their face. Are y'all hearing me today? <laughs> but nevertheless, you know the end of the story. When we left that insurance office, we had a plan in place to ensure that if I should perish prematurely, that the church school will be taken care of. We had a plan in place to secure that, that to ensure that college would be paid for. We had a plan in place to ensure that the mortgage would be eliminated because I wanted to make sure that if I should perish before my time, that my children would not be broke dependents, they would be blessed beneficiaries. Now my testimony pales in comparison in fact, others who've been set up by their parents. I was reading this week about John D. Rockefeller. Have mercy. John D. Rockefeller was the wealthiest man ever to live. Hear me. It states that by the time of his death, listen to me, by the time of his death, he by himself owned 1.5%, not of the GDP, of the entire net worth of the United States of America. The equivalent of what would be now $336 billion. When he died, watch this. He gave so much money to his children that the only job they could take would be, would, the only job that they could really handle was to become full-time philanthropist. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, you know your daddy is rich. When the only job that you can manage is a job giving away your money. The Rockefellers, hear me, were blessed beneficiaries. But what I want to suggest today is that you may have never received a whole life insurance policy from your parents. And you may have never received a billion dollar endowment from your daddy named John Rockefeller. But the good news of the text today is that when Jesus Christ died on Calvary, he did not leave us money, but he did leave us as blessed beneficiaries. The fact is that you have to understand that when Jesus died, he left us something more valuable than money. He left us power. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When Jesus died, he left us something far more potent than a yacht or a mansion. Jesus left us victory. Jesus, hear me, Jesus left his children with the assurance that when you fight sin, you shall win. 
that's your inheritance. It says it right here in Ephesians 1, verse 18. Look at this. The Bible, here's Paul. Paul wants his, his people to understand that he wants their eyes to be enlightened to what their inheritance is. And so he says, the eyes of your understanding being what, everybody? That you may know what is the hope of what? What are the riches of the glory of what? His inheritance in the saints. So you've got to understand today that Jesus, hallelujah, left his children filthy rich in the spirit. He left his children, he, he left his children drenching in Holy Ghost power. He left his children so set up that if, if you could see beyond the veil, you would see a devil that trembles at your wealth. Because he understands that once the children of God understand how much power they have in Jesus, the devil has no power over them. In fact, when you understand you're that wealthy, you begin to walk a little bit differently. I remember I was in elementary school, and I had a friend of mine who had a wealthy daddy. And I noticed he came to school with a different kind of swag than the rest of us. Are you understanding? He, 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 he walked different because, because his financial problems were few. He understood that he didn't have to worry about the class trip because he had a wealthy daddy that was going to foot the bill. Y'all hear me today. He didn't have to worry about the school uniforms because he had a daddy that was going to foot the bill. He didn't have to worry about the tuition. He had a daddy that was going to foot the bill. In other words, I discovered that when your daddy is wealthy, your problems are few. Oh, it's a dead house today. Uh, uh, uh. In other words, I want you to understand today, because your heavenly father is wealthy, your problems in the spirit are few. I'm not saying that you're not going to have problems here today, but I'm saying, watch this, your problems won't overwhelm you because your daddy is rich. I mean, what, what is it? So what your rent is due? You got a rich daddy who said that, listen, that, that he shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. So what? You're discouraged. You have a daddy who promised that weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. When you have a daddy who's that wealthy, you have become a blessed beneficiary. In fact, one of the problems in the church is that we have people who have a wealthy spiritual father, but you have an impoverished faith. I don't know about you, that, that when, when the tide began to turn in my house and my parents, particularly my father, began to make a little bit of money, I became a little bit more bold in my request. Come on now, don't play with me. You know, before I was asking just for bus money, but when he started making real money, I said, I want a car. <laughs> Come on now, Dad, I haven't given you any problems, never had to pick me up at the jail. I said, I had kids after, I, I, I tried to live right, I tried to do what you asked me to do. And listen, and my father, bless his heart, sent me back to Oakwood with a, in 2000 with a 2000 year Honda Accord. Come on, give God some praise. And watch this. And what I'm trying to tell you, church, is that when you have a wealthy father, he makes investments in his children. That's why, hear me, that's why I, I refuse to allow the enemy to have possession of my soul. He can harass me, but he cannot conquer me because my dad is rich. This is what Paul is trying to convey to us here today. And I want to suggest to us today that there are some people in the house of God who need to understand what God has left us in Jesus Christ. So let me, let me share what, what Paul is trying to convey to us today in Romans, the sixth chapter. Paul now shifts his focus from justification by faith to now sanctification by faith. In other words, now Paul wants to share, okay, here's how God positions you for holiness, but now here's how God makes you holy. And I don't know about you, folks, with all this grace, make no mistake about it, I want to live holy. Are y'all hearing me today? I want victory over sin. Are y'all hearing me today? I want power over the enemy. So Paul now is teaching us how can we live a life that is in harmony with the will of God. And listen to what he says in Romans, the sixth chapter, verses three through four. I mean, listen, hear, hear the word of God today. He says, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, well, what, everybody? Paul says that when you were baptized, next verse, is, is, is that verse 4? Yes, okay, now here it is. Now watch, watch the gospel unfold. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into what? That just as Christ, whew, 
Look at what happens. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Watch this. Read this last part. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Now, wait a minute. Paul says that when you were baptized, that you were baptized into the death of Jesus. But he says you were not just baptized into the death of Jesus. He says you were also given the power of the resurrection of Jesus. So that now, just as Jesus rose from the grave and is free from sin, so now you have risen from the grave and are free from sin. Woo. Paul says that even though you deal with temptations, the reality of what happened at Calvary is so potent that now sin has no hold over you. That's good news to me. You see, you see, what happened at baptism is literally that God has given to the church the Emancipation Proclamation. Are y'all hearing me today? You all, you all do remember the Emancipation Proclamation. You better say, man, your mama paid all that money for that church school. You do remember. Huh? Slaves bound, not just under Jim Crow. I'm talking about bound under a system of legalized incarceration. But when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, watch this. They still had issues, but they had freedom. They still had to deal with economic issues, but they had freedom. And what I'm suggesting today is that at baptism, you may still have issues, but you have freedom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You still have some stuff you're struggling with, but you got freedom. Are you hearing me today? And, the, and Satan does not want his church to understand that because he knows the moment you get it, the moment his power is broken. Wait a minute. It gets better than this. Here's what he says in verses 6 through 7. Then he says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be what? That we should no longer be what? Come on, folks. For he who has died has been freed from sin. In other words, because of the death of Jesus, sin may be still present in the world, but sin no longer has power over me. Yeah, yeah. Because of what Jesus has done at Calvary, we still have to deal with sin, but sin does not have its foot on our neck. You can call, folks, let me tell you something. Right now, what Jesus has done at Calvary is that every time you face temptation and every time you face a test and every time you face a trial, all you have to do is call on the name of the Lord and God said the power of the crucifixion is yours because you are a blessed beneficiary. You talk about a death benefit, <laughs> you can keep your yachts, you can keep your mansions, just give me victory in Jesus. That's what the Bible says. In other words, God has given us the power, hear me church, to tell the devil, you literally cannot hold me. You can't check me. He is, he is telling us that we can look Satan, hear me, we can look Satan in the face and declare, you have power but you do not have power over me. You cannot hold me. Mm, okay, they're not getting it. Let me, let me, let me help you. Um, some of you may remember, you may remember uh, in, in the 1990s, the Cleveland Cavaliers were having difficulty trying to get past uh, the, the daunted uh, Chicago Bulls. And so every year, they would literally get to a place in the playoffs where they would, they would try to get past Mike and the Bulls, but they could not. And so what they did, they went out and they, they drafted what they called a Jordan stopper in the name of Jared Wilkins. You remember that? Anybody remember Jared Wilkins? So they, they drafted Jared Wilkins and they, they heralded him as the Jordan stopper. They were saying, here is the man that's going to get us over the hump. But lo and behold, in the 1993 playoffs, game three, some of y'all remember it, Jordan dropped, watch this, Jordan dropped 43 points on Jared Wilkins and to put salt in the womb, he literally walked by the Cavs bench and this is what he said to those who drafted Gerald Wicken. Put it on the screen. He said, he can't guard me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
You, I'm not, you talk about putting salt in the wound. And literally, watch it. He annihilated Wilkins, dropped 43 points on him, and then literally said, watch this, you can't hold me. But child of God, I need you to know today that Satan has devised plans and tactics to trap you, to destroy you, and to hurt you. But because you are a blessed beneficiary, you can literally walk to Satan in the face and tell him, you cannot hold me because I am been bought by Jesus Christ and my power comes from him. That's the power that God has given us. Watch this. He can harass, but he cannot hold you. So, so I want to share with you today, if this is true, how do we reap the benefits of being a blessed beneficiary? I want to share with you three points today. How many points? Three points that, that are literally, will literally transform. I'm talking, to, I'm talking to somebody today who's been struggling with sin for a long time. You come to church week in and week out asking God to give you victory over sin. God brought me here today to tell you, you are a blessed beneficiary. And the power is yours. How do you receive it? Well, first, we must give ourselves what? For the what? Mm, mm, mm. We must give ourselves for, uh, uh, credit for the victory of Jesus. Here it is, Romans 6.11. Watch this. This thing is powerful here. Romans 6.11. In the same way, do what, everybody? Mm, no, you, you didn't read it with enough passion. Let's do this again. Read it. Read the whole thing. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive in Christ Jesus. That word, count, or that phrase could literally be translated, consider yourselves dead to sin. Mm. In other words, Paul acknowledges that complete death to sin takes time. But Paul says, while you are in the battle to overcome sin for eternity, your first step is to treat death to sin as though it were real, even though it's still a work in progress. He says, the first step in overcoming is to literally to look at sin and even though sin is harassing you to be able to declare that sin is dead because of what Jesus has done at Calvary. Now I understand. I, I knew I wasn't going to get a lot of amens there because some of us are challenged on this issue. We are challenged because we believe that we can only speak victory after we have achieved victory. Yeah, yeah. See, that, that's the challenge. The challenge is we're giving Satan too much credit. Just because we fall, we believe that our strength is God's strength. But I want to suggest to you today that the first step in victory is giving yourself credit for what God has done and being able to declare, even though I'm struggling, I'm saved, I'm a blessed beneficiary. I want to suggest to us today there's another challenge. The other challenge is that many of us have a problem calling something dead that feels so alive. Y'all hear me today? Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying, Pastor. You're saying sin is dead, but, but you, you just don't know. If it's dead, it's like the walking dead. Are you hearing me today? <laughs> I hear what you're saying, Pastor. But you, you, you just don't know my story. Because if, if you understood everything that I've gone through it, and some of the stuff I'm going through right now, you would not declare that sin is dead. You would say that sin is very much alive, but you must understand something. That just because it's dead doesn't mean it still can't move. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I'll I, I give you an illustration. Let me help you out. Um, Pastor Tony Evans, you ever, ever heard of uh, Tony Evans before? Pastor Tony Evans? Okay. Pastor Tony Evans tell, tells a story of a time that he was actually performing a funeral, and so he walked up to the mortician, and the mortician decided to kind of, you know, tease him a little bit. He said, uh, Pastor Evans, I want you to know, he said that... Um, that uh, even though we work with the bodies in the funeral home, he said, uh, sometimes there are, there are, there are muscular uh, contractions that occur um, even in these dead bodies. Now, for me, that would have been my sign to put up my Baptist finger. <laughs> Y'all hear me today? <laughs> and listen, I believe in the state of the dead. I just don't test it. Y'all hear me today? <laughs> I believe in it. He said, so, so Pastor, there are sometimes... There are sometimes, he said, that we're working on a body and we can see the, 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 the eyelid blink a little bit. That's just a muscular contraction. He said there's sometimes we can see some movements a little. He's, he's teasing them, and that's just a muscular contraction. He said, as a matter of fact, he said, true story, last week, actually one of the bodies fell off the table 
because the contraction was so strong. <laughs> now let me tell you, uh, listen, I, uh, that, that would have been, been my sign. Do you have a witness in this house? Find another job. Wait, wait, wait. So Pastor Evans, Pastor Evans, watch this. Pastor Evans said, well, he said, and I'm sorry, sir. He said, I, at that moment, this is Pastor Evans talking to the man, would have to find another job. He said, how do you do this job? He said, well, Pastor, I'm not worried because I know that even though it's moving, dead is dead. <laughs> you see, you see, I want to suggest to you that the first step in victory is understanding that even though it's moving, that dead is dead. And even though you are fighting temptation and fighting sin, the power that God has given to us, the, the benefits of the cross is that I can look at something that's living and call it dead. So now I treat temptation differently. I said, I'm struggling with this thing, but in the name of Jesus, it's dead because I'm a blessed beneficiary. And watch this. And the more that I speak this thing, it frustrates Satan because he doesn't know what to do with somebody who's so weak but has so much confidence in Jesus. How does he shake your faith when you come to the place where you recognize you have nothing but Jesus has everything? And I'm going to tell you something. You come to that place and what you will begin to find is that God will start doing in you what you are declaring over you. Sin will begin to lose its power. But I don't want to leave you there. I believe there's another, another step in the process here. Not only must we give ourselves credit for the victory of Jesus, the second thing we must do is meditate on the what? We must meditate on the what? Holy desires of Jesus. Hear me today, church. You see, you have to understand something. Sin is progressive in nature. Everybody say progressive. So by the time you reach the point of infraction, you have literally crossed nine warning signs that God has given to you. This is why I hear folks say all the time, now I'm not judging, hear me today, I tell folks all, all the time, oh I made a mistake, I, I slipped up. No, you didn't make a mistake. <laughs> oh, you made a mistake, but the mistake was not at the point of the infraction. The mistake happened 10 steps ago when the Holy Ghost told you not to answer that 2 a.m. text message. See, see, I had to go there because y'all too quiet. I had to go there. I had to go there. That's when the mistake happened. The mistake didn't happen huh, at the Holiday Inn. The mistake happened when you, you should have told that rascal, no. Are you hearing me? Sin is progressive in nature. And sin begins, watch this, not with the act. Sin begins in the mind. Mm. And so because Paul understands this, here's what he says. He says, therefore... Do not let what? <laughs> it's all, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. All right. Therefore, do not let what? Sin. Oh, come on, no, don't, 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 don't be afraid of that word now. See, we don't like, see, we don't even like to talk about sin in the church anymore. Huh? I pass the love of grace, but sin, wrong is wrong. Y'all hear me today? He says, do not let, that's an imperative. Do not let sin do what? In your mortal body because if you do you will what obey its evil desires he says don't let it rain now I find it interesting that Paul does not say do not let sin come in Paul says do not let sin rain in other words Paul acknowledges the fact that because of the sin of Adam and Eve sin will invade the mind but he says although sin comes in you have two choices you can listen to the holy desires of the spirit or you can listen to the evil desires of sin. In other words, when the enemy tempts you to dishonor God, you can turn your ear to the one who encourages evil or to the one who encourages holiness. Break it down even more. Uh, when the spirit tempts you to cheat on your taxes because now you're paying more than you were paying last year, come on, say amen. You have two choices. You, you can choose to listen to the desires of the evil one or listen to the desires of Jesus Christ. When you are tempted to look at the skirt that's too short, you can, you can listen to the desire of the evil one or you can listen to the desire of Jesus who says, run. How many folks know ain't nothing wrong with running? Huh? 
Listen, my grandmother said, rather be a live chicken than a dead duck. Are y'all hearing me today? You see, what, 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 what I'm trying to hear, help, help me hold the spirit. What I'm trying to convey is that if you're going to have victory in sin, over sin, you must first win the battle of the mind. That's where the battle begins. Most of the time when sin occurs, you have lost the battle of the mind months ago. You, you're upset of what you've done, but God says, I want you to be upset of the process that has led to sin. It's the process that gets us in trouble. And what Paul is telling us today, hear me church, what Paul is saying today, Paul is saying that I want you to begin to win the battle of the mind. He, he paints this picture, watch this, of two kings battling for one throne in the mind. And whenever you have two forces battling for one spot, you never come out of that scenario without a struggle. And that's the word Paul wants to convey today. That overcoming sin, watch, is a struggle. But the joy is that my salvation is not wrapped up in the struggle. My salvation is already wrapped up in Jesus. So I'm struggling from a saved place. Whew. I'm wrestling not for my soul. I'm wrestling to grow into the banner of Jesus Christ. So let me, let me, let me, uh, let me, let me, let me help you this way. Um, last week there was a film that came out. Don't know what the film's name is. <laughs> you know, I, I, I had to throw that in. I had to throw that in. <laughs> Black folks dressed up like Kunta Kinte walking to the theater. Hear me, it was about two entities battling for one throne. And as I listened to people who were commenting about the movie, here is the spiritual point that came out of that, that movie. Is that whenever you have two forces battling for one throne, you will always have a struggle. And what God is telling us is that we have to make some decisions as to, watch this, as to which direction we are pointing our lives in. And hear me today, this is why, now I, I need to say this today, this is why I, I, I appreciate the turn that Adventism has taken. We have come to the place, praise God, where we are no, no longer caught up with some of these traditions that have hindered us from seeing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Y'all hear me today? Because there was a reason, hear me, there was a reason why our ancestors told us not to go to the movie theater. The reason was, was because most of the, let's be honest, not just movie theater, Netflix, whatever you want to call it, most of that stuff is vying for supremacy for our mind. Are you hearing me today? So what we've done, we've thrown out the baby with the bathwater. We're going to the movies. I don't care where, if, if, if it comes on PBS. And it is not congruent with where God is taking your life. Turn it off. You have to understand that God is trying to vie for supremacy. He wants to be the king of our minds. And he can't compete with the stuff that's happening right nowadays. I tremble. Folks, I tremble for my children. I praise God. I thank God for my two babies. But I tremble at what they will have to deal with in 20 years. Jesus, the, the, the type of evil that's vying for their minds. And folks, let me tell you something. One of the benefits, one of the benefits of being a Seventh-day Adventist Christian is that God has given us instructions on how to keep the mind stayed on Jesus. And I don't know about you, I want my mind to be fixed in, and, and fixated with the cross of Calvary. Can you say amen today? So I believe God is calling us, let me just be honest, I believe God is calling some of us to change our, our, our spiritual appetites. Some of us are watching some things we have no business watching. We're going some places we have no business going. We listen to some music we have no business listening to. Are you hearing me today? Real talk, y'all, real talk. God says, I'm not asking you to do this to be some hard-nosed Christian. I'm asking you to do this because I want your mind. Want your mind. It's not just the young folks. Old folks too. I don't care if you listen to Tupac or Frankie Beverly. Come on and say amen. You know, don't, don't play with me now. No, I, I know my music. God said I want your mind. If you believe that, can you say amen today? 
Now, here, here, here's the last point. Here's the last point. I believe that the last point God wants to share with us, put that on the screen. If we're going to achieve victory over sin, then we must be compelled to holiness by the glory of God's grace. You see, the subject of this series is grace that works. In other words, the Bible teaches that God's grace is so potent and so powerful that the byproduct of his grace is that it changes lives. The byproduct of God's grace is that it changes us from a position of hostility to a position of loving Jesus more. It's right in the text, Romans the 6th chapter in the 14th verse. Put that on the screen if you will. For sin, hallelujah, shall no longer be your what? Because you are not under the what? You are under grace. Now, that some have used this passage of Scripture to suggest that this is New Testament proof that we are no longer bound to live in harmony with the Ten Commandments of God. But you must understand that this is not the context of which Paul is teaching or preaching. Paul is teaching in the context of what he states. And go, go back one slide for me. Go back one slide right there. What he states in Romans 6.14. Listen to how he begins this verse. He says, sin shall no longer be your master. That's the benefit that God has given to us. And what Paul is trying to convey to us today, that as you grow in grace, in the grace of Jesus Christ, there are two attitudes that you can take, two positions that you can, you can uh, rest on. One position is the position of the law, which is a position of condemnation every time you fall. But the other position, hear me today, is the position of grace. It, it is a position that God is not done with you when you fall. Yeah. Are y'all hearing me today? Uh, the, the attitude of the law, hear me today, condemns you when you fall. It denounces you when you falter. It judges you when, you when you miss the mark. But when you live under grace, it accepts you back when you confess. It dusts you off when you have slipped. It gives you mercy when you need grace. Paul says, if you really want victory, you must understand that God does not condemn, but God has not come to condemn. He has come to save. And he says, when you come to that place, you will find there is power in the grace mindset. Because, folk, let me tell you something. When you understand how much God has forgiven, whew, thank you, God. And when you understand how much God has bestowed upon you, and when you understand that God has given us our best spiritual blessings in our worst spiritual moments, the natural byproduct is to say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee, nor the help that I know. I live my life for you and no one else. Folk, I want to suggest today that one of the greatest blessings, I'm almost done, one of the greatest blessings that God has given to the church is the blessing of grace. The problem is some of us have taken advantage of God's grace. God has blessed us time after time. And like ungrateful, come on now, ungrateful children. You know how that is. I have, are they, they're right at that phase now. Daddy, daddy, daddy. I said, my name is Braun Jacobs. That's not my name. <laughs> gimme, 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 gimme. I just gave, are you hearing me today? Always taken, never given. <laughs> That's how we are, come on, come on folks. That's how we are with Jesus. Always taken, never giving. But one day, God's grace will run out, but he says, now I give, man, thank God, I give my grace in infinite measures to anybody who needs it because God's grace has the power to transform. God's grace has the power to heal and to deliver. As a matter of fact, hear me today. I want to tell you something. Listen, listen to this. You can't overcome sin until you have had an encounter with God's grace. Because once you understand how loving he is, there's a switch that happens in the heart. And you will say, Father, if you love me that much, I will serve you for the rest of my life. Here's how the servant of the Lord says it. Play something, listen to me. Listen to this. This, this. this quotation has radically transformed my spiritual life. Because here's, here's, here's where the devil gets us. I was talking to a member here. They shared this with us. Hear me. Here's how the devil gets us. He says, if I can't get them to fall off the cliff in unrighteousness, 
I would get them to become discouraged in their pursuit of righteousness. Are you hearing me today? He says, if I can't get them, if I can't get them to drink and to sleep around at the club, what I'll do is I'll become them, I'll, I'll cause them to become so discouraged in their pursuit of Jesus that they would end up in the same place that they were if they were living an evil life. So God says, I don't, I don't, he said, I don't know how I'm going to get you, but I'm, gonna, I'm trying to get Jesus, I mean, or Satan, I don't know how I'm going to get you, but he's coming, trying to trip up God's people. But as Dennis sang today, hallelujah, were it not for grace. It is the grace of Jesus that gives us hope and a future. Here's what the servant of the Lord says. To go forward without stumbling. That means to live a life that's victorious over sin. We must have the what, everybody? That a hand all-powerful will hold us up if we fall. That's the secret. You want to overcome sin? Have a mindset that is pointing in the direction of Calvary. And even if you falter, to have a view of God as one who is not crushing your spirits, but lifting you up and saying, keep on walking, my son. Keep on walking, my daughter. God alone can at all times hear our cry for help. Isn't that good news? Hallelujah. And so today, I thank God. My parents... They didn't leave me a mansion in Bethesda. They didn't leave me a yacht on the Potomac. They didn't leave me a chateau in McLean. Uh -huh, but Jesus left me victory. <laughs> Man, that's good enough for me. Jesus left me power. He left me the ability to be able to look at demons in the face and declare, even though it feels alive, in Jesus you're dead. If you hold to that power, the Spirit of God will hold you up. I want you to listen to the words, the song that's being sung of our and this would come at this time. Because there's power in the cross, folks. There's power in what Jesus has done for us. And today, he wants us to leave this place knowing and understanding that we are not orphans. We are blessed beneficiaries. Listen to the words of the song.
points I want us to take from our sermon today, points of action I'm calling them, what, what is God now calling us to do with what we've heard today? And I believe first, you put that on the screen if you will, God is calling us as his people. This week, you must understand that your victory over sin begins with your belief in your declaration. This week, and we'll put this on our social media pages so that you have reference to it. Whenever you find yourself tempted, struggling with evil, struggling against sin and temptation, God is calling his people to pray what we're calling a prayer of victory. It's a prayer that says, God, I thank you that the power of this sin has already been broken. Jesus broke it on the cross, and I claim his promise that it is already broken in my mind and in my heart. And I declare to you that by the power, you are following a biblical prescription. Romans 6, 11 says, count yourself dead to sin. That's Paul giving us instruction. And the more you begin to proclaim that over your life and to believe it, you will find that sin will have to loosen its grip on your life. Because its power is in our mis misperception. So this week, God is calling us to pray a prayer of victory. But I believe there's one more. Put that on the screen, if you will. This week, ask God to give you the strength to struggle to keep Jesus on the throne of your life. You must understand that I'm not asking you to do what I used to do back in the day. You know, you do something wrong and then you start to say, what's my action? What can I do? No. I'm saying, Father, there's a problem in my, I'm making some mental decisions that I need you to alter for me. I'm making some choices at the point of suggestion that I need you to help me with. Because if he can, watch this, if God can get in your mind then he can save you from there if he can if listen if you if he can if he can seize the throne at the suggestion then you never have to deal with the sin and so this week God is calling for some people right here to say father I'm asking you to invade my thought life so that at the point of the suggestion I can say I serve a risen Savior who's in the world today can you do that church and third, thirdly, here's what God is calling us to do. To ask God to take his grace and transform it into holiness. <laughs> Man, listen, there's nothing that makes the enemy more impotent and more angry than seeing people who stumble their way into perfection. Who trip their way into transformation. Because what God understands, listen to me, what God understands is that I'm in this thing for the duration and if you can take and ask God to transform that's the prayer God the grace that I've received would you transform this into transformation for your glory if you can do that then God will begin to place you on the path to victory we're not done with Romans because Romans 7 is next week it's gonna blow your mind and then Romans 8 is powerful because God has some more suggestions but it begins here and if you're willing today to pray that prayer of victory if you're willing today to invite God to invade that space at the moment of evil suggestion, if you're willing today to say, God, I'm asking you to use your grace to transform my life for your glory, would you just stand today? We're going to ask the Spirit of God to seal this thing. Just stand all over this place. We're done. We're done. We're done. We're done. But there's somebody here, maybe in the balcony before we close today. You know that the Spirit of God wants you to give your heart and your life to him. These few moments are for you. 
either through baptism or rebaptism, you know the Spirit of God is calling you today. This church is praying. Slide out of your seat. Give us your hand. Give Jesus your heart. Where are you today? These last few moments are for you. God is saying, by baptism or rebaptism, are you here today? The Spirit of Jesus is moving. We're closing. Just sing that song. Just sing that. Just for me. Sing it, church. Just for me. Just for me. Just for me. Just for me. Hallelujah. Let's just worship him. Jesus came. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes, he did. Just sing that. Oh, just for me. Just for me. Hallelujah. Just for me. Oh, thank you, Lord. Saying, Jesus came and did Oh, just for me. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father, now in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for the benefits of Calvary. God, we thank you for what you've given us because of the cross. At the cross, you broke the power of sin. And Father, here, here's the reality. Even though it doesn't feel like it, dead is still dead. <laughs> Even though, Father, there's still movement, dead is dead. Because in Jesus, the victory is complete. And for this, we are grateful. So this week, Father, help us to pray that prayer of victory. To claim what is as though it has now become. And to trust God with the results. Help us today, Father, because some of us in this church right now, some of us in this church right now, we are, we are, we are too concerned about image to be able to do some of the things that are embedded in our mind. But it's there. And the only thing separating us, Lord, from acting it out is opportunity. So in the name of Jesus, transform us at the point of evil suggestion so that we might be able to place Jesus on the throne of our lives. And Father, finally, use your grace for your glory. Change us into your image, we pray. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Let God's people say amen. Come on, say amen again. Hallelujah. Maybe you see this thing that just for me, just for me as we exit out today, just for me. Let's lift that up, church. You may be seated in the presence of God. Just for me, sing it. Hallelujah. Yeah.